Hello, hello, and uh, this is uh, Bishop Run C. Hill, and uh, this is Noonday Wednesday, lunchtime for you in this spiritual world. I'm glad you tuned in on today. I would like to begin by telling you that you are unique in every respect. Out of the billions of people who walk planet Earth, there's never been one who is exactly like you. They may look like you. They may, they may sound like you. They may walk like you, may have your same color eyes, old, but there's no one uh, 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 has been on this planet or will ever be on this planet who's going to be exactly like you. So you are unique in and of itself. And God loves you perfectly. God doesn't love anybody on this planet more than he loves you. And it is God's desire to have a relationship and fellowship with you. However, it is, uh, it is most necessary for you to understand that you have to deal with God by faith. The Bible says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Then the Bible says in Hebrews 11 and 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Now, that verse had a profound impact on my life back in the day. I'm talking back, back in the uh, late 70s, and, um, uh, certainly in 72, 73, when I had um, given up a secular employment to, to walk with God. Now, I'll tell you, friends, when I read that, that, that God would reward those who diligently seek him, my first question was this. What does it mean to diligently seek God? I, if he's going to reward me, and listen, if God's going to reward me, I had to know that it was going to be a great reward to receive from God. And he promised that he reward me, and I thought, well, God can't lie. He's got to keep his word. So I need to concern myself with how does one diligently seek God? What were the particulars? And again, how was it to be done? And so I, I got on in a, a search for that. I discovered that, that one cannot seek God except with, in two basic ways, the word and prayer. You cannot seek God without exposing your spiritual man, your inner person, to God. And you can't seek God without communing with God from your heart by speaking to God, by using the creative tongue that God has given you, by speaking back to God what God has spoken to you. So I learned that. So I, I got into the Word of God, and I discovered that when I talked to God, I had to use a certain name to speak with him, that I couldn't just, just barge into the presence of God. I couldn't just, just break into the presence of God without knowing how to approach him. I, I discovered that I needed to approach him in the name of his son, Jesus. And throughout the, Old, and throughout the New Testament, it talks about, asking for, for favors from God in the name of Jesus. In other words, uh, uh, that was the key, uh, shall I say, that would unlock the door for me to have access to God by coming in the name of Jesus. Number, one. Number two, I also discovered that when I would go before God, that I needed to have faith and confidence that God would do for me what he had promised, those two things. I had to use the name Jesus to approach God. And secondly, I needed to be confident that God would do for me what he had promised he would do. And then I discovered that it would require for me to get into fellowship with God in order for me to have the level of confidence uh, in the name of Jesus and the level of confidence in his word that would give me 
the, the internal strength, or should I say, that would give me the, the bold tenacity to go before God in prayer continuously, although I didn't see anything. Uh, back then, during that time, I didn't see anything. So I got into prayer. I got into diligently seeking God. Initially, as I first stated, I saw nothing. I didn't see any market change in my life. And I, and I, and I get a guy now I'm reading books on prayer and, and people start talking about praying for an hour and, and they talk about certain great men of God would pray three hours and more a day. So I got into doing that. I got into, I, so, so I broke it up. I would break up the time. I'd pray an hour in the morning. Then I'd pray an hour around noontime. Then I'd pray an hour prior to going to bed. Then I started getting, getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning to be in prayer at 5 a.m. And I did this for, for over 25 years. Matter of fact, 30 years actually of getting up at 4 in the morning to go to 5 o'clock prayer. Now, as I first stated, initially I saw no change. But slowly, God began to speak to me. Do you know the first tenure of what God began to speak to me about was? He began to speak to me about making adjustments within myself. He spoke to me about my attitude. He spoke to me about how I was using my body. And he spoke to me about how I was using my time and energy. He wanted me to see that he wanted me. And it took months for him to communicate that to me. Well, I, I restate that. It took a time for me to hear it. You know, sometimes God is speaking to us, but, but we don't hear him because we are so intent of, 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 of speaking to God. You know, you know, prayer is a two-way street. You talk to God and then listen for God to talk to you. Don't do all this to talk it. Don't spend all of your time talking. Uh, plus, I can tell you this, that I have, uh, I have uh, gotten to the place in my, my walk with God where I can be speaking right now, and when I pause, I'm listening for the voice of God. I want to know, as I talk to your people, is there anything specific that you would like for me to address towards a particular person while I'm speaking? If so, I'm open to it. You see, I'm pausing right now to hear if God has something he wants me to say. So remember, again, that prayer is a two-way street. You talk to God about what you want to talk to him about, then allow God to speak to you. And I'm going to give you some, hopefully give you some confidence. God is far more concerned about uh, fellowship and with you than you are with him. Initially, before I started fellowshipping with God, I was in fellowship. Now listen, I was in fellowship with Satan and with demons and with lies and with darkness. I was, I was in fellowship with the same kind of spirit that sinners are uh, in fellowship with on today. The sinners, they fellowship their father, the devil. Prior to my coming to know Jesus, that's who I fellowship with. Once I heard the gospel, got convicted by the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost revealed to me how ugly I was in sin. It broke my heart. And then he also revealed to me that there was a way out of my sins if I would repent, change my mind about how I had been living, turn my back on Satan the devil, turn my face towards God, accept Christ into my heart, and become a new creature. Then after becoming a new creature, I needed to forge a fellowship with God. I needed to know at that point that the most important thing in my life after receiving Christ as Savior was to set up a, a, a communication network with God and to understand again that God was far more concerned about fellowshipping with me 
than I was with him. It was God who so loved me that he sent it, that he sent his son Jesus to die for me. It wasn't my so loving God. I didn't love God at that point. I loved sin at that point. I loved the world. Like some of you, if you're in today, you may not want to admit it, but some of you people, oh God, okay, I have to say it. I have to say it. Don't let this offend you. But some of you people need to take the time to consider what you say you believe. Some of you need to repent of your sins. And you need to have somebody lead you into accepting Jesus as Savior. Because some of you think like sinners, talk like sinners, and in large degree live like sinners, and that's what you are. You've never been born again. You may have been brought up in the church or started coming around the church, but nobody ever challenged you to be born again. And hey, brother, sister, please, don't, don't let this offend you. I'm trying to help. It, maybe you don't need this, but there's somebody else watching today who need to hear what I'm saying. Now, let me get, and before I go off today, I'm going to give you, sister, and you, brother, an opportunity to accept Christ as Savior. Now, listen to this point very well. The God of the universe, the God of all creation, the God who is omnipresent, that means he's everywhere at one time. He is omnipotent. He's omniscient. He knows everything that can be known, and he's the God of all power, and he is perfect in love and in holiness. And he's perfect with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. This is the God who loves you. And uh, he died to fellowship you and to save you. Did you catch that today? Uh, just stop and let's, let's think elementary for a moment. Let's become elementary, basic uh, thinkers for a moment. God loves you. The creator sent his son to suffer, to bleed, and to die on the cross for you so that he could have fellowship with you. He wanted to save you. And then he left a, a book on record, the Old and New Testaments. And all he's saying in the Old and New Testament is, I am God. Let me show you how I'm God. He did things over and over in the Old Testament. And he continued to do things in the New Testament. And after the penning of the writing of the New Testament, he's yet doing things today. All God is saying is, I want you to trust that I'm God. Because, because according to the scriptures, but without faith it is impossible to please him for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Does it not stand to, to, to reason that if you really, really, really believed that you have access to the creator of all things, the perfect El Shaddai, the God who can do anything has made himself available to you and you're not going to seize this opportunity. It's impossible, friends. See, the, the, the reason why many people in the church today don't have a prayer life and they don't expose themselves to the word of God, don't mention fasting, and, don't, and, and they, are, they don't want to pay their tithe, they have want to go to church. Why? Because they haven't heard anything. They haven't seen anything. Because I'm telling you, friends, once you have a spiritual epiphany of who God really is, once you have a genuine encounter with the creator of the universe, and he comes to you, and he convicts you, and converts you, and regenerate you, and make himself known to you, you'll never be the same. At that point, you need 
to begin to be a diligent, diligent seeker. But unfortunately, there, there are men behind the pulpit who are not diligently, diligent seekers. There, there are people who are still trying to enjoy their flesh and enjoy Jesus at the same time. There, there, there are people who, who think that they can't really be fulfilled without enjoying part of the world along with enjoying Jesus. And, and where do they get the idea from? They get the idea from satanic lies. Satan, in the same fashion that he lied to one-third of God's angels in heaven, Satan, who lied to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, is the same evil spirit that is lying, uh, lying to us today. But God wants you to hear him. He loves you, and he wants to save you. He wants to sanctify you. He wants to baptize you in the Holy Ghost. And he wants to become your Savior, your Lord, and your Master. He wants to fill you with Holy Ghost and pour Holy Ghost gifts into you, pour Holy Ghost fruit into you, pour Holy Ghost power into you, and for you to be led by Holy Ghost. God wants to navigate your life. That is the only sure way of fulfilling your purpose in life. You, you got people who build great cathedrals and great high-rise buildings and own jet planes and have done a lot of things, but the one thing they're missing in their life, they're missing knowing the will of God and walking therein. God does not want that to happen to us. He doesn't want that to happen to you, sister and brother. He wants you to know that he's, 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 he's spoken it from the Old and New Testament. I am God. My son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is my Savior. The Holy Ghost is my guide. and my, is, 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 The Holy Ghost is to be your guide and your teacher. And you can depend on the veracity of the Word of God. It's, it's right there for you. And people are trying to find God in all other kind of ways. God is in the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Dear brother, dear sister, if you want to know God, you can only know God by the Word and by the Holy Ghost. And stop allowing these false prophets to make you think that, that, that you can just have them say something to you and fulfill you. No, sir, no, ma'am. Jesus the Christ, Jesus Christ, the one who suffered and bled and died on the cross and shed his perfect blood for our salvation and has provided the Holy Ghost for our impartation and the word of God for our foundation is the person that you get life through. And, and as a matter of fact, one can't even come to this Jesus without being invited by the Holy Ghost. And so the mere fact that you have viewed my face today tells me that either you have been drawn by him or you have an interest. And I say to you today, if you know that you know that you know that you have been regenerated, you know that the God of the Bible and the God of all creation are one and the same, prove that faith statement by becoming a diligent seeker, by coming to that time in your life where you believe that God can do anything. I'm reminded of the ruler. He's one of my favorite men of faith in the Bible. In the, in the ninth chapter of the book of St. Matthews, there was a rich man, a ruler, who came to Jesus and he said to Jesus, my daughter is now even dead. But if you come and lay your hand on her, she shall live. And do you know what Jesus did? Jesus got up and began to follow after that man. Because that man had what it takes to get Jesus or to get God the Father involved with your life. When he sees faith in your heart, when he hears it coming out of your heart, he will, in, he will involve himself 
with you for sure. And what did he do? He went down to the home of this dead girl and raised her from the dead. Why? Because her father had the faith that it could happen. Do you have the faith that things can happen in your life? Let, let me read this to you. And, and then, of course, I, I do want to pray with those of you who want to be sure you're saved. Why not do a do-over? Don't don't if your life is in a tailspin, going going down tailspin spiral in life, things aren't going well for you. Do a do-over. It's nothing wrong with being sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior. It's nothing wrong with asking for Him to to forgive you and, and to establish the fact that you accept Him as Savior. And that's what we're going to do in just a moment. Now now listen to this. I, I'm I'm reading from uh, Saint uh, Matthew chapter eight. And um, I want to put in at verse number one. When he was come down from the mountain, talking about Jesus, by the way, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. I love it, I love it. He is a man who was desperately ill. And needless to say, leprosy was a dreaded disease because had one contracted leprosy, it was a death sentence. But this leper somehow had heard about Jesus and this leper had the confidence that if Jesus wanted to, that he could make him clean. Now, I, I realize that, that some of our faith teachers in years gone by would, would take you to task if you would say what this man said. I, I, I don't allow those ultra faith teachers to, to, to influence me when it comes to my dealing with my God. This man said these words. Um, he worshiped him, first of all. He worshiped Jesus by making a statement of faith. May I tell you, when you make a statement of faith, in effect, you are worshiping God. How do I know that? Because this is what the scripture says. Note here. And behold, there came a leper and worshiped him, saying, this is the way he worshiped him, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. In other words, I know you can do it. It's no question about whether you can do it, but will you do it? Now, now you, you, you have a lot of uh, uh, teachers back, uh, I forget, 30, 40 years ago. They were arguing about, oh, I'm going to live to be 120. So, and I can call names, but I'm not going to do that. I don't need to do that. They would say, oh, I'm going to live to be 120. And I would yell at the TV. I said, no, you're not. They said, yes, I am. And they didn't. They didn't. Because, now, they could have. Had God willed them to see 120, they would have seen, they would have seen it. But it's obvious that God did not want it to be. Because had God wanted them to live to be 120, they would have. Uh, there are people who, um, who had limited faith in the, the fourth stage of cancer, lying on that deathbed, about to go to the other side, and somebody would just come and pray a flimsy prayer, and they get them and get healed. There were others who were steeped in scriptures, had a Ph.D. in theology, had church people all over the country praying for them. They had fourth stage cancer, but they died. Who can understand that? Don't let anybody tell you that they understand that because they don't. That is in the purview of God to do what God wills to do when God gets ready to do it. There I was with two arteries blocked in my heart and a third artery blocked 80%. And I gained a lot of weight and I was fatigued. I got into a tiff with my doctor, my, my primary doctor, because he didn't want to send me to a cardiologist. And I had to say, say to him, listen, man, I know my body. We got in a little argument. He finally uh, agreed to send me. And, and they went up through my groin, and they discovered two arteries blocked, 100%, 180%, and I had to get a triple bypass. Their minds were blown because they couldn't figure out why I hadn't had a heart attack. Why didn't you have a heart attack? We don't know, they said. But when it went into my heart to take arteries out of my leg to replace the clogged arteries to my heart, they discovered that on the backside of my heart, my heart had grown out 
three secondary uh, arteries that kept me alive. In other words, it wasn't my time to die. There were others who had the same condition that I had and they dropped dead with a heart attack. But it wasn't my time to do it. It was not the will of God for me to die then. And, and he kept me here for a reason. I'm telling you, friends, that if God's will, God can do whatever needs to be done in your life. And don't let anybody tell you that it's wrong to pray if it's your will. Listen, listen to the word. And behold, there came a leper and worshiped him, saying, Lord, if thy will, if thy will, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will. I will be thy clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. I'm telling you, friends, listen, God can, if he will, he can, he can change your marriage. If he will, he can save those drug addict sons. If he wills, he can, he can bless you financially. If he will, he can heal any condition. Father, I pray that whatever's going on with this, this lady and this man, if you will, you can give them a miracle. I'm praying that you do, and I know that you can. All you have to do is touch them. All you have to do is move for them, and if you do it, it's a done deal. Somebody receive it today by faith in Jesus' name. Now, before we go off the air, if you want to be sure you're saved, open your mouth and say, Heavenly Father. That's right. Say, Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner, but I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he suffered and bled and died on the cross for my sins. And I believe he arose from the dead on the third day. I now repent for all of my sins and I open my heart and I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my savior. If you prayed that prayer, there's a number on the screen, call them. And let them know that you accepted Christ as your Savior. Also, those of you who have been blessed by the teaching, I need you, sir, and I need you, ma'am, to stand with me financially, and God will honor you because it's impossible to give and not receive. Mm -hmm. Next time. Consider financially supporting Food for Your Soul television broadcasts. Together, we can change lives. Your support will allow us to reach the world with the good news that Jesus saves. You can give online at loveandunity.org. Click the Give button, and it will take you to our secure page where you'll have the option to give by credit card, debit card, or bank account. You can set up a one-time or reoccurring gift by linking your preferred payment method. You can also text a gift by texting the amount you desire to 310-507-1181 or mail to P.O. Box 5449, Compton, California, 90224. Thank you in advance for your support.